This is Donald Parham of the L.A. Chargers, and you're listening to Chargers Unleashed, part of the L.A. Football Network. Stay Three, tuned. two, one. This is Chargers Unleashed Podcast. Here are your hosts, Dan Wolfenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the L.A. Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by UFC Fit and Temecula, Golden Road Brewery, Charger Bolt Family, Tick Pick, and Bet Online. If this is your first time tuning into the show, you can, of course, follow us on YouTube, hit that like and subscribe button. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, hope you had a great inaugural Father's Day for yourself. First one in the books. How did it go? Um, thank you. Um, Father's Day went great. Uh, ate a lot, got some time with some family. Uh, had a fun little shirt combo thing that my wife got, my daughter and I. I was uh, genius from Step by the way. Yes, my wife made shirts. Um, they can call me, or she was, they can call me Dragon, and I had a shirt that had uh, Nighthawk. My wife made logos. It was pretty adorable. So, first, Father's Day in the books, I call it a, a whopping success. Um, how was your weekend? I mean, it's already almost the end of the week. How was your week? <laughs> I mean, the week has been ebbs and flows. <laughs> you know, what can you say? This is this is the time of the season. I don't know how many times I'm going to have to repeat this over the next couple of weeks, but this is the time of the season that I hate, and for good reason, because the NFL news right now is sparse at best, especially as it relates to the Chargers, because we know that we don't return now, especially with the dates being announced today, that we're not returning until the middle of July for training camp, at least until ju- rookies don't even come back, Dan, until July 19th, which <laughs> sounds like light years away. From where we're currently. So what do we do? I mean, it's gonna like go on a hiatus for a month and just like come back. No, that's not how it's gonna work. That's not how that's not how this show is done. We have we have to continue to do this, obviously. But you just like it if you knew that there was guys on the football field. Guys, get the pads on for crying out loud. Get me to September. Hell, I'll even take August right now. (laughs) Bring me to preseason. Come on, I don't care. I'm sick of tuning into NFL Network right now and watching nothing but 2021 replays. Ain't that the truth. So Give me something fresh. We get to create and generate content and topics. So I think of a fun one for you guys today. Uh, There were a few articles that we wanted to kind of go over that were released this week, one of which was from Lindsay Theory that went over the 53-man roster. Another one Daniel Popper came out with today uh, or this week as well. And then probably the gist of this discussion today is going to be all around, you know, Jake, there, there's all kinds of, of vibes in, in Chargers country, right? And everybody talks about like, oh my gosh, Chargers going to the Super Bowl or became the Chargers in the AFC West. And I, I think what we wanted to do this episode was look at it from a lens of like over or under kind of prop bets and looking at what we had last year versus this year. Jake and I are going to kind of go rapid fire to each other. We each have not seen what the other person's prop bets are, but we are going to pose them to each other one at a time. And we are going to go live over under and give our reasons why. But before we get into that, Jake, we got to pay the bills. BetOnline.ag. Good friends of the show. Talk about them. Yes, indeed. Our partners over at BetOnline continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information via all of the latest odds and sports development, including this year's NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. It could end here very soon if you've been watching it, obviously. Major League Baseball, UFC fighting news, and even next year's NFL futures. That seems appropriate, considering that we're talking about prop bets today, of course. Head on over to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get the bonus and get into the action. Bet online where the game starts. Dan, take us there, Skitch. Skitch. Do I know who Skitch I don't know who Skitch is. Please tell me. No, I brought this up to you before, man. You got to go back and watch that thing you do with Tom Hanks. Again. Oh, that's right. Oh, you great got mo- me again. Great movie, late 90s. Come on, man. You got to do got me again. If anybody thinks that they have a better recollection of movie titles and um, phrases from movies than Jake Hefner, you're wrong. You're- the, the only, the look. I, and not that I'm challenging him because Wooldog and the guys over at Chargers Chat Podcast are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, 
I think that those guys could actually give me a real run for the for the money. I Kevin's it. Kevin's in the movie business for crying out loud. I'm sure he could. Him and I have definitely the horror vibes going on. This sounds us. like a good like episode. It's just going to be strictly movie. I would love that. Let's just make an entire episode about football and somehow tie <laughs> movies into it. I okay, let's do it. So first up, Jake, let's talk about some of the articles that came out. Uh, there was one from Daniel Popper that talked about Trey Pipkins and kind of his uh, maturation and development this last year or so uh, compared to what he's been like in years past. But let's go first with the Lindsay Theory one. Uh, you mentioned that he had that she had an article released recently of predicting the Chargers 53-man roster. Uh, what were some of the key takeaways you saw from that? Anything that you question or you wonder if it will come to fruition? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, we're again. Uh, let's let's say that phrase again that we said last week. Uh, we are in June, so these are very early predictions. Of course, none of this is, uh, you know, indicative of what is going to happen. Um, we're far <laughs> so away from final. Just take this with a grain of salt. If you want to look it up and compare it to what last year's roster was. But there were some things here on certain positions, especially with some of the talent level that the Chargers has brought in in this offseason, that I, you know, kind of raised my eyebrows a little bit and, you know, got got me curious as to why we came to the conclusion. So the first off, once again, she has us keeping three quarterbacks, Dan, Justin Herbert, Chase Daniel, and Easton Stick. Now, I know that there are a contingent of Easton stick fans out there that would love to see Easton stick be the backup quarterback of this team. People have been clamoring for it for years. And trust me, if, if that is your heart's desire, congratulations, more power to you. Here's my golf clap to you for that. Um, my personal feeling is, and Easton stick along with a couple other people that ended up making the final 53 roster last year. If you just want to use that as a barometer, you could have used a couple extra bodies, whether it be on offense or on defense, mm -hmm. rather than a QB3. And I don't really know how much of a ceiling Easton Stick has at this point. We'll see him obviously play again when it comes around to the preseason. Uh, I know the highlight for him that got us all excited was his long touchdown run that he put up in, in the preseason of his, rookie, yeah. of his rookie year. But I don't know. I know, no, I, I, I understand the insurance policy. I understand hedging your bets. And look, the, the biggest reason here is, is that we should never be expecting to see Chase Daniel or Easton Stick ever set foot on the field. You are being, you are being way too kind, my friend. How am I being kind? I literally say there should not be a need <laughs> for quarterback three. Right? I may be, be di diplomatic, but in so yes. many words, yes. I don't think that there should be a QB three. Let me be, let me be blunt. It does not give, I do not give a rat's ass who our QB three is. We don't need one. It does not matter. If we are thinking about QB three, the season's lost anyways. You know, Dan Wolkenstein has had a long day when he already starts in the first 10 minutes of the podcast saying, I don't give a rat's ass. <laughs> it sounds like he's got a little bit of my attitude on here today. I do I like it. I'm coming hot. Today. I actually hope it can. I hope it continues throughout the rest of this show. So, Dan, feel free to let loose because I'm sure you're going to have a lot of other opinions Ooh, as we go good. through this. <laughs> these no, but, but, but in all seriousness, like, cool. Easton Stick is QB2 or Chase Daniel. Everybody's talked about kind of the pros and cons of both of them. Regardless, if either one of them is the quarterback of this team this year, Chargers aren't going far. Period. End of discussion. Move on 2023. Bam. Done. So it doesn't matter. Okay. Next position up for debate. And this was an interesting one. So this is including the fullback in here, Dan. So when you were talking about the numbers, so as far as running backs goes, she had the Chargers keeping five. Now, again, this is including the fullback. So Aust Austin Eckler, Isaiah Spiller, obviously. Shocker. Joshua Kelly, Larry Roundtree, and your fullback, Gabe Neighbors. So... Let's get the fullback one out of out of the way already. So Gabe Neighbors, does he have an advantage over Xander Horvath as it stands today in June? Yes, he does. Why? Familiarity with the system. He knows it better. We'll see how long that lasts because I truly believe 
that not only was Xander Horvath brought to this team to supplant the fullback position, but to take over a little bit of what Steven Anderson meant to this team in that that H-back hybrid type of role where you're going to roll him out from the fullback position and have him go upfield and be ke- being catch- uh, and catching passes because Xander Horvath is versatile enough to be able to do that. Now, Dan, if you'd like to make a comment on that before we really get into the other two question marks of this I can't wait for group. the next part. Nope, oh, we're good. Fullback will keep it. Although I probably would argue that Daniel Horvath might have a leg up only because he was recently drafted. Yes, obviously. So that's 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 recency bias, obviously, and that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense just because he was a seventh round draft pick. But Dan, we've seen them get rid of sixth round draft picks, fifth round draft picks before the season even starts in <laughs> in, in years past. So it may not be as secure as you think, even though I think. There's no way that Xander Horvath is going to be coming. No, but I am. But I, the more interesting part to me is we all saw kind of the undrafted free agents that were brought in on this team. Uh, Letty White amongst them, who I actually really like, I think will make the team. You're talking about uh, Letty Brown? Sorry, Letty Brown, excuse me. We have <laughs> Isaiah Spiller, obviously, Austin Eckler, obviously, but she has Larry Roundtree, Larry Roundtree. and Joshua, Joshua Kelly, Kelly. both you know, making the roster. This one reminded me of that old definition of insanity, Dan. What's insanity when you keep doing the same things over and over and over and over again? And trust me, nothing personal or against Larry Roundtree or Joshua Kelly. But when you get past the Isaiah Spiller, and especially for the running back situations that the Chargers found themselves in last year, where you were just looking for anybody to step up behind Austin Eckler, do something to take the load off, just to find an RB2. And it just virtually seemed outside of what uh, uh, Justin Jackson brought to the table that there there was nothing. There was, as far as being a consistent contributor, it just wasn't there. Early on in the season, you saw a little bit more of Larry Roundtree. Joshua Kelly showed spurts here and there, but you just really couldn't get that consistent. And Dan, you were even saying this to me where we were talking about it off the, off the, off the show. How many snaps did – whichever guy essentially was RB three during these 17 week spans, did they really go in for? And I was telling you it's easily less than five per game. It, it, and I may be statistically wrong, but damn it. It felt like it was less than five. No. Cause if, if you think about it and Chargers fans, you know, this all too well last year, it was like Austin Eckler was your running back one by a landslide. And then, Kind of Justin Jackson when he was healthy, but he wasn't healthy very often. And then it kind of just felt like it was Austin Eckler 95% of the time. And then the rest of them, it was like, can someone get a first down? And most likely the answer is no. So Austin Eckler has come out multiple times and said, I need somebody to help me. And in short, no one helped him last year. And enough to where it really impacted the team. That's what we needed this year. So Jake, I'm sure I cut you off. No, no, no. It's fine. Do you, see, do you think both Roundtree and Kelly make this team? No, look, the there's no way, talking, right? If we're just talking strictly about numbers here, the Chargers should not keep more than three running backs on the final 53. If you want to take one of these guys, you want to sign them to the practice squad, that's totally fine. But you kept four running backs on the roster last year, much like the QB3 situation. I feel that if you did that once again, keeping four running backs and a fullback on this final 53, I think that would be a not the best use of resources. So to me, behind Isaiah Spiller, it's basically a toss-up at this point. Dan, you mentioned Letty Brown. Have him fight it out with Joshua Kelly and Larry Roundtree. And through these three preseason games and through training tree, who's going to be the best guy that's going to be there? I don't see one of these guys being that polished of an asset that if you were to allow them to hit the market and you were fearful of them not being able to sign on the practice squad, that that's why you kept them on the 53 roster. I don't see that as the case here. So have them battle it out. And if you want to keep someone in reserve, then bring them to your practice squad. But by no means just from the needs that you have on this team at other spots, should you be keeping four running backs and a fullback? 
Yeah, and I, and I would say this. A, a lot of what the Chargers did this offseason at the running back position specifically was like, let's look at some guys who can who can fit a specific scheme, right? Who, who, can, who can be a particular archetype that this team needs. And you look back at their college film, and I challenge, you know, people might say, you know, Joshua Kelly may have a chance. People might say Larry Roundtree has a chance. I challenge everyone out there, go back and watch the college football highlights from Letty Brown, Kevin Marks, Joshua Kelly, and Larry Roundtree. And you tell me who are the more athletic possible stars, possible contributors, I should say, to this team. I do not see how someone could say that Roundtree and Kelly are the two that have the most potential, the most to offer on this team. I, I just can't see it. Yep. I just can't see it. So yeah. if they do, if they do have four, I sure as hell hope it's not those four. <laughs> just gonna, I'm just going to be honest. I'm just being honest. Just, just to get out of the rhythm of you doing the exact same thing that you did last year, essentially. Yeah. I mean, cause you know what you had last year and, and like they could be, they could be improved. Sure. But do those like is that what the team really needs now that exactly. you have Isaiah Spiller? That's the right question. That's the right question because Isaiah Silk Spiller closes that gap significantly of your question mark surrounding who's going to at least step up to be an RB two. That should be fixed as it stands right now. Let the the battle for RB three begin. <laughs> so yep. wide receivers, Dan, and this is this is pertinent because I tweeted about this over the weekend. And we happen to be talking about this last week. So in her article, Lindsay Theory has the Chargers keeping five wide receivers. No just, surprises here. Just five. Just five. No surprises here. Chargers kept five last year. Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Josh Palmer, Jalen Guyton, DeAndre Carter. No surprises. Now, we started bringing up other possibilities. And as we had heard last week in Daniel Popper's article, one Joe Reed that we have not heard of or heard from, excuse me, in a very long time, essentially in one full season, had a pretty nice little mandatory mini camp for those two days. As far as what he was doing, he was back healthy. He was making contested grabs as Popper said. And as Dan and I talked about, he definitely has a long road ahead of him to get to the 53. And I tweeted out that if, if that's a big, if, if his play was to continue through training camp consistently through the three preseason games, I would be okay given his skill set, given how it's different from a majority of the rest of the wide receivers on this roster, how you can utilize him. And this is a bigger reason of why I'm making this case because of the value that he possibly brings from a gadget receiver to a different type of person that you can roll out special plays to. He does have some special teams capabilities behind it as well. These things add value here. So if, and only if this play type of play from him continues this preseason, I would be okay for the chargers doing something that they have not done since 2020. And that's keeping six wide receivers on their final 53. Just two years ago, Dan, they kept six. I would like to see six. I the the problem is like the six spot is gonna be tough because like at that point it's a matter of like what flavor do you need? Mm -hmm. Like you, you got Joe Reed, who I think we all like. We all like that athleticism, we all like kind of like that breakaway stuff, but like what he provides on special teams, I think the team already has with DeAndre Carter. And already has with like Nazir Adderley, who could do some punt returns as well. So that's a little bit superfluous. Now I, I don't, as a as a re, as a receiver, John Drake Carter kind of has that similar thing. I don't know if he necessarily know if he has as much of the size as him. And so like, I don't know. Like I. You got you got guys like him. You guys like Jason Moore. You got guys like the what's the UDFA kid that we got this this off season? Uh, uh, Trevon Bradford, who some people like. Um, I just that here's a here's a comparison, Dan. Here's a, here's how much of a difference two years makes. Here was the six that the Chargers rostered on their fifty three man just two years ago. 
Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Jalen Guyton, Jason Moore, KJ Hill, and Joe Reed. That was the six receivers that made your final 53-man roster just a two short years ago. That's crazy. <laughs> so if you were to tell me, again, if the conditions apply to Joe Reed moving forward through training camp and preseason, it, would you take that Joe Reed over an RB4 or a QB3? Yes. yes. As would I. As would I. All right, moving on, Dan. Tight end group. This should surprise absolutely nobody. Three tight ends remain on this roster. Gerald Everett, Donald Parham, Trey McKitty. Now, the reason that the Chargers kept four last year with it being Steven Anderson, because Steven Anderson brought a lot more to this group than simply just being a tight end. Um, you saw how he essentially unseated Gabe Neighbors at the fullback spot. They used him a lot more from the halfback position made their offense a lot more multiple with him. So now with the Chargers only keeping three, Dan, I'm okay with this. I, Dan, I know we talked about it last week, uh, and Daniel Popper was not, notice, uh, noting it Sorry, in his practice reports, but Stone Smart, the undrafted free agent tight end, has already been turning heads and making plays during camp. But in this particular circumstance, I think he's a fine practice squad candidate. I don't see the Chargers this year exceeding three tight ends, just given who they already have rostered. I think that's versatile enough from a blocking standpoint, from a receiving standpoint, from a versatility standpoint. I'm okay with just three tight ends here on this for this list. Yep, same. Okay. Offensive lineman here, Dan. Rashawn Slater, Matt Filer, Corey Lindsley, Zion Johnson, Storm Norton, Trey Pipkins, Brendan Hymas, Jamari Salar, and Will Clapp. That's nine. Normally, 9 of 10 is like the sweet spot that you normally have with offensive linemen here. Um, I don't, you know, just looking at this here, I don't actually have a problem with this lineup at all. I think the depth has severely, has greatly improved in, in one year. If we're just talking about who's behind your starting five, or as it stands right now, four, because we have, we still don't have any idea of how the right tackle position is going to pan out. But essentially having, a rotation of either Storm Norton, Trey Pipkins, Brennan Hymas, Jamari Salar, and Will Clapp as your depth pieces. That's not bad. I would take it. I will take it. I think this is chalk at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, what, who does they have for the linebacker spot? You wanted the linebacker spot. Um, again, as we talked about, this is one of the weakest positions as far as depth goes on this team. And, and this should really surprise nobody, but linebackers are Kenneth Murray, Drew Tranquil, Troy Reader, and Eggman Ogbenigma. Four. Interesting. Four. Okay. So the kid from Akron, not LeBron, the other kid from Akron <laughs> is not there. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Which is, and, and like you said, it it's very interesting considering, are you going to be that gutsy and that risky given the surgery that Kenneth Murray's coming off of as tremendous of a player as Drew Tranquil is. And in my opinion, plays a lot. This defense collectively plays a lot better when he's on the field, but you know that he's been dinged up here and there, not to say that he necessarily can't be reliable, but behind that you have a linebacker that Brandon Staley has brought in that he's had familiarity with during his time with the Rams in 2020 on a one-year deal. And really a, not an undrafted, I mean, an undrafted free agent from just a couple of years ago, but that really hasn't had, I mean, I know that I, from everything that we've heard, Dan, we know that the coaches love Eamon. They're extremely yeah. high on Eamon. So then, I just don't know if you can just simply say to go into next season with only four linebackers. Okay. Then then real quick, go to the, go to like the edge rusher. Cause I'm wondering what they're, cause I'm, I mean, I don't know if she has like outside linebacker and mid middle linebacker connected. So what I just, what I just listed off to you, that was the inside linebackers group. Okay. So the outside linebacker slash edge group that consists of Cody Mack, Joey Bosa, Kyle Van Oy, Chris Frump, and uh, Amike. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so that's the one. So that's probably where Jamal Davis would end up being. Oh yes, you, you I now I now I follow you. Yes, that's Ty correct. Shelby's also possibility mm. to be there. Interesting. Okay, got it. I mean, it, 
I would, I think what she's pointing to is probably chalk, but I think that last spot is going to be up for grabs. You think he'd be a toss up? I could see that. I could definitely see that happening too. I think the, isn't it Jamal Davis? Isn't that who you're thinking of from Akron? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm talking about a kid that's jacked. I watched some of I watched some of his tape in the off season as far as when the Chargers signed him. It's just kind of like, you know, not nothing guaranteed, but you're just like, okay, all right, mm-hmm. we'll see what happens with that. So it could be the camp battle essentially could just be for edge five. That's what we're talking about there, Dan. Edge five. Yeah, and then uh, let's go to I think safeties was the last one that had anything worth mentioning. Correct. Yeah, I'll mention cornerback just on the surface level because it may surprise you a little bit and some other ones. J.C. Jackson, Asante Samuel Jr., Bryce Callahan, Michael Davis, Tavon Campbell, mm-hmm. and, and Jasir Taylor. Tavon Campbell. Hmm. I know. <laughs> Thoughts? You just have to leave it at that. You, <laughs> you don't have to say anything else. I, I, I get it. I get it. Let's just say this. Your your depth immediately is already better than what you had a year ago as it mm-hmm. relates to this cornerback group. Um, other guys that are not here in this list, obviously, um, it sounds like Deontay Leonard would be going to the practice squad if he's not here on this 53-man roster. Cayman Hall is not going to be there. Um, but again, we're in June. We, we shall see what happens. So... So Ben, so, so guys like Ben Deluca aren't on this team. Keem ben Hall Deluca, would, but Keem Ben Hall Deluca probably be is flame. being listed more as a. I would think he's being listed more as a safety, even though I know he's got that versatility. I still think that they would probably consider him more as a safety. And speaking of safeties, speaking of safety, Dan, this one will really prick your ears up, especially after we were talking about this uh, in context a lot during the mega crossover. Here's your safety group. Derwin James, Nasir Adderley, JT Woods, and Alohi Gilman. No. Now, <laughs> I know. No. Before I could even utter my first no. word. Which Dan's absolutely right. <laughs> and if if we're paying attention here to all of the, you know, what's what's the word? The, uh, the tea leaves that have been dropped out there. Just go back one week ago and listen to Brandon Staley gush about one Mark Webb and the expectations that they had for him, even going into last season before he got hurt. The standpoint of the versatility that Mark Webb brings to this defense on top of what he brings from a special teams value is what's going to hinder Alohi Gilman making this roster. And as Dan said, and even Hagler was talking about with their own conversation on the mega crossover was you've now really buffed up the athleticism of your defensive back group. And if we're just looking at it from an athletic standpoint, Alohi Gilman is toward the bottom of that list. I think he's at the bottom and that's not a slight to him. I think he's just at the bottom. Like this is called spade, spade, <laughs> man. Other than, uh, other than that, Dan, uh, the defensive line, um, who's yeah. the, who's the last interior line? Interior defensive line. Sebastian Joseph Day, Austin Johnson, Jerry Tillery, Morgan Fox, Brennan Fajoko, and Tito. So they went six. They went six. Okay. Which leaves out Christian Covington, which leaves out one of my favorites in Forrest Merrill. Mm -hmm. But keeping Brennan Fajoko is a great decision. The question marks are still there as to whether or not Jerry Tillery will even make it out of preseason. I know some people don't believe that he will. Um, time will tell on that. So that'll be a tough pill to swallow. Not going to lie. You're just saying from the scope of yeah structure, team roster, getting rid of a first round draft pick, that would suck. Right. I, I get that. But also just, maybe, but like, there it is. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Jake, moving on. Uh, Daniel Popper. Yes. Came out. I know a lot of people talk about kind of like the one glaring question mark on this team is the right tackle position. And everyone kind of is clamoring for, should say everyone, but many people are clamoring for Matt Filer to switch over to right tackle. Um, but the coach has been pretty headstrong around Storm Norton and Trey Pipkins. And we're starting to hear rumblings that Trey Pipkins is improving, and which, again, we've heard every year. Uh, but you're kind of starting to see it and hear it from folks that are outside of the coaching staff. Like we're hearing uh, Chris Harry talk about 
But the difference is that he's seen on the latest, I think it was Chargers Weekly that he came out with and talked about like what he looks like a real man. Uh, Daniel Popper talked about it as well, which you'll get into. Uh, training with Duke, with Duke Mannyweather, who's also there with uh, Rashawn Slater, who's there with the former Charger. Um, why well, is his name escaping oh, me? Ode? Ode Abushi, excuse me. Uh, I have said I would like to see Trey Pipkins earn that spot. Earn that spot is the key word. Not given, earn that spot. If someone tells me that he has earned it over Matt Filer, if someone tells me that he has earned it over another free agent that came in, cool. But don't just say, I want Matt Filer, I want him there because I want to keep everything else the same. Like, as much as I think that's what they would do, I would love it to be Trey Pipkins busted his ass all offseason and he looks like a completely different player and he deserves to be a right tackle and he's going to show you guys all what he means. Is that what Daniel Popper says? Yes. Um, oh. What I really, I mean, what I Let's really. Go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel Popper. <laughs> what I really like about what Popper highlighted here outside of the training with Duke Mannyweather, which I'll get to in a second, was I know that when you just look at the differences between Storm Norton and Trey Pipkins as far as their performance at right tackle. You know, we go back and we pigeonhole certain things as far as certain games. Mostly everybody right now, recency biased, when you think of Storm Norton, you think of the last game against the Oakland Raiders that he played horribly. More notably, or maybe not more notably, but you go back to the early part of the season, week two against the Dallas Cowboys, Micah Parsons essentially made his name known to the NFL against Storm Norton in that game. Um, so Storm Norton had a very rocky 2021. And I know that when we talk, when everybody talks about, you know, saying Pipkin should be the guy this year, you know, look what he did in Kansas City, stepping in at left tackle when Rashawn Slater got COVID, or stepping in for uh, for Storm Norton against Denver, and played two of the best games that he's ever played against the game in Denver. He didn't allow one single pressure, as Daniel Popper noted, notes. But the, I think the one thing that some of us forget, and this may just be because as a team that the Chargers got railroaded in this game. When you go back and you look at the game that the Chargers had against Baltimore, and this is what Popper highlights here. I believe it was in week six of last year. Remember this game, Dan, where the Chargers just got absolutely trounced by Baltimore? There was a lot to look at that maybe you just didn't pay attention, but Trey Pipkins did not have a good game when he was in there and was actually inactive for four straight games from week eight to week 11. And then so to see him come back the way he did against Kansas City was a testament to it in itself to then build upon that um, again again, uh, in the game that he came in against Denver. But he goes into that as far as his perception of of the struggle since he's been drafted, working to get better. And then, of course, last year, just getting benched, getting inactive. Uh, What he really what Pipkins really talks about in this article with Duke Mannyweather is the focus from Manny Weather on bio, I I think he calls it, uh, is is bio, uh, uh, oh my God, biomechanics. I can't believe I could not get that word out of my mouth. Biomechanics. (laughs) So he's basically comparing, it's like, it's the little stuff that while he compliments the offensive line coaches are super good with the football fundamentals, this takes it to just a whole different type of focus level that Duke Manny Weather really hones in on that he really likes, that he knows that's bettered his game. Um, And again, you go back to the little things, just as far as a simple thing about where your foot's planted and how that weight is going to make a complete shift in the rest of the play. Um, You know, he's building on it, and I'm really rooting for him. We all knew when he was drafted to the surprise of many of us that he was raw. It was going to take time to develop, but he had those athletic traits. And if it gets to a point now, and especially in a big year for him, where it's the last year of his contract with the Chargers that's coming up, and you could put this together, I'm pulling for him. I really am. Am I? Do I still say that there's question marks? Yes. I'm not. I'm not saying that it's going to be a a foolproof, you know, defensive (laughs) plan that that's your wall in front of Justin Herbert and that's going to stay rock solid. I can't say that, but I am pulling for Trey Pipkins, giving everything that he's done to work on himself and what's on the table for him. I would say this, we've said it from the beginning. If we could just get like 
maybe average or above average for the right tackle position this year. I think we're in great shape. So do I like? Do I think Trey Pipkins is going to be like a stud, like Rashawn Slater on the right side? Like no, no, no. no. But if, but if he could be serviceable, if he could, if he could just kind of hold his own for most of it, I think the Chargers are good. So I think like the baseline that I am looking for, I'm hoping for from him, is probably lower than I think what other people are thinking, which is why folks want a Matt Filer out there on the right side, because they want it to be like a pretty darn good right tackle. Whereas you've heard a lot of people talk about like right tackle is one position that you can kind of scheme towards if you need help or doesn't necessarily need to be as beefed up as you would think for other positions, especially left tackle or can improve much faster year over year, which now new offensive line coach, maybe we'll see. Um, so, Jake, put your, money mouth, put your money where your mouth is right now. Gun to your head. Who is our starting right tackle week one? Starting right tackle week one. Uh, I, I honestly don't see a route here. I've said it that I felt that Matt Filer was the, would, would be the smart decision. If the Chargers were being smart. So, okay, so you're saying the Chargers are stupid, is what you're saying? No, I'm not. Well, <laughs> nice way to twist my words there, pal. <laughs> but, okay, sorry, let me retract. The safe, <laughs> the safe decision, since Dan <laughs> wants to call out my words here, the safe decision <laughs> would be to move Matt Filer from left guard to right tackle. Now, Dan, you were saying a second ago, if the only reason that you could come up with with Matt Filer not being the right tackle is because you want continuity along the line, well, you know what? I'm going to raise my hand right now and say, you know what? I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. I do want some continuity yeah. along the line. I like the idea of Zion Johnson coming in to fill that right guard spot because I would think that whoever he's standing next to, obviously we know who's to his left at Corey Lindsley, but to his right being the right tackle spot, I would hope that that would improve said players play as well with having a guy like Zion Johnson in that particular spot. So left to right, Rashawn Slater, Matt Filer, Corey Lindsley, Zion Johnson. And you know what? Let's yeah, go. I'll say it. I think that Trey Pipkins Me too. will ultimately win out this camp battle. Me too. Well, that's a good segue, Jake, because now oh, this, is gonna be fun. this is going to be fun. Jake and I, we're going to go through rapid fire, one at a time, prop bets that either we have found or that we have made up for the 2022 season for the Chargers. Jake, would you like to do the honors or would you like me to go first asking you? See, my, mine's, mine's simple because admittedly so, Dan had a little bit more time to create these prop bets. Oh, uh, here we are. Our, already Which, hedging his bets. I'm not hedging the bets. I'm just saying... <laughs> I may be answering more of these bets than explaining them or giving them to Dan because Dan had a little bit more time for <laughs> these prop bets on this particular segment. But I'll start off with mine. Dan, this is a very simple one, one that people should be able to find anywhere. But I think it relevant, especially given what we've talked about, and you love to talk about this, when, especially when it comes to regular season, what's going to be the Chargers win total or what's the prediction of the games and blah, blah, blah. So currently as it stands right now, DraftKings has the over under for the Chargers at 10 wins. Earlier on in the season, Dan, I had them at 11. He said 10 and a half wins. Is that what he said? It's, it's 10, not 10 and a half, just 10. Okay. Over or under 10. Obviously this should be simple. <laughs> I mean, I think it has to be over. If you don't want the Chargers to to make the playoffs, you right. better say over. That's that's basically how it is. It, it has to be over. Um, There's no way that the Chargers are making the playoffs this year if that if that win total is under ten. No, although I'm I'm kind of surprised that it's at ten. I would have thought they would have put it at ten and a half. Uh, I think it's got to be ten. It, or excuse, it's got to be over. I went over. Yep. Pretty easily. Same for you. Yes. Okay. I, I had him at 11. I'll, I'll even stand by that right now and say it's 11. Okay. Um, Jake, you ready for this one? We'll start off yes. with kind of a gimme. We'll let this thing kind of ride off swiftly, easily, slowly but surely. Jake, over or under 5,000 yards passing for one Justin Herbert? See, I'm going to – now, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it's under, and I'm not saying that as a detriment 
or to bring down Justin Herbert. I think from the standpoint, when you look at, and I, I target specifically the Isaiah Spiller draft choice here. For the third straight year, the Chargers drafted a running back. Isaiah Spiller definitely is different from the other two individuals that you drafted the two years prior. I think, first off, that the Chargers are not going to be playing from behind as many times as they were last year. I think their defense is going to give this offense a little bit more opportunities. And moreover, I think they're going to maybe look to take a little bit of weight off Justin Herbert's shoulders and become a more balanced offense. Much like the Washington Redskins game in week one, Dan, how good was that to see when it was six and a half minutes on the clock and the Chargers never gave the ball back? You just grinded out the last part of that game, whether it was by converting first downs off of Justin Herbert's arm, or you were able to create running lanes and let Austin Eckler run through them. It didn't matter. I would like to say, I would like to see more of those situations more often. So right now I'll say it's under 5,000 yards. I think I'd agree with you. And I I think you can easily change it to will Justin Herbert need to pass for more or less than 5,000 yards? And I think then you would definitely would say under. And I think that's a healthy thing for the Chargers team. Uh, he won't have to throw for as crazy Superman-like numbers because of the team he has and the roster he has around him, in theory. Uh, and right. yes, the game against Washington football team was a thing of beauty last year. And I don't think I've ever... I think it was the only time last season where we're like, whoa. It wasn't even a high-scoring game. I no. mean, it was actually a pretty well contested game but i mean it had been a long time since we had seen a drive like that from this chargers team yeah all right dan i got one for you just looking it up on the whim and and if i'm stealing one of yours i apologize that's okay but a one jc jackson mr int as he calls himself 25 interceptions over the last four years last year he had eight the previous year he had nine Let's put let's put the line at eight and a half. Does J.C. Jackson in his first inaugural season with the Chargers have over or under eight and a half interceptions? Hmm. Now, I'm gonna go under. I'm gonna go under, and that's not a knock at J.C. Jackson. I just think that there is a ton of ball hawks on this team, and I kind of see it more of like a spreading the wealth type of thing. So I'm gonna go under. Again, like I think Asante Sam was going to have some. I think you're going to see Bryce Callahan with some. Derwin James is definitely going to have more than he had last year. Uh, Michael Davis. I mean, Nazir Adderley. I, I think I, I don't think he's going to get nine. I'm going to go under. Okay, that's fair. Um, okay, so we talked about the offensive line here a bit, Jake. So I'm going to give you an interesting one. Uh, over or under thirty sacks allowed. The entire season. And for context, for context, last year, they had 31, which was eight fewest in the NFL. So I'm giving it over under 30 in 2022. I'm going to say it has to be under. It has to be. It's there. And obviously it's contingent on what the right tackle situation brings to the game, but the Chargers investing high for the second year in a row in another offensive lineman. Um, you know, who knows what type of a role Jamari Solar is going to play with this team if it even ends up inserting himself at all. We do know he could play tackle. We don't know what will eventually happen with that, um, but he may just end up being relegated as a depth piece as it stands for this year, probably the most likely scenario. But I just don't see how this offensive line does not improve from last year. I get it. I understand that there's still essentially an empty spot right now at right tackle, but putting Zion Johnson into the right guard spot next to a Corey Lindsley across from a Matt Filer and a Rashawn Slater. When you see how well that combination worked on the left side, I just, I just can't see that same number replicating itself. So I have to go under 30. So I'm going to go under 30 as well. Uh, so that would be improving upon the eighth best last year in sacks. And I, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing it for a different reason than you, but same result. Um, obviously Zion Johnson beats up the interior. Obviously Jamari Sawyer helps. You got right tackle. That's still kind of a question mark, but like 
I think it's going to be, I think whoever it is going to be improved from what we saw from Storm and Trey last year. Um, but on the flip side, I think this is going to be kind of a sheer math equation where I think they're going to throw less and run more. And so there will be less opportunities for sacks. So given the addition of Isaiah Spiller, given the addition of Zion Johnson, and given the kind of addition of the defense allowing them to have more time to kind of rush, like run out the clock, I think it's going to be under. And so if we could get to top five in the NFL, like imagine that, Jay. How sweet would that be? That would be nice. That would be nice. All right, Dan. I've, I've actually got one here for you. I'm actually, I think I'm able to figure things out to talk about in a relatively rapid manner. Okay. That could become interesting questions. One guy that we should be talking a lot more about, and I'm sure we will as the season gets closer, is the Chargers' newest tight end, Gerald Everett. And when you look at the season that Gerald Everett had last year, oof. <laughs> Oof. But, I mean, again, we're taking in context is that he was playing in one of the worst offensive outputs in Seattle last year, even with a Russell Wilson at the quarterback spot. So for 2021, Dan, Gerald Everett, this, this was his stats, 478 yards, 10 yards per reception, four receiving touchdowns. Okay. I would have to think that that number – definitely picks up coming to this offense. So I'm not going to say simply does it go over his 2021 stats. Let's put the bar at, let's be generous. Let's go, let's go 800 yards and seven touchdowns over or under that for Gerald Everett. Ooh. Oh boy. I'm going to go under on both. Not that it's a bad thing, but I'm going to go under on both. I think you're going to see the 800 number is pretty good, but I'm going to, I think you're going to see kind of low sevens is my guess. And I think we're going to see, I don't see him as much of a red zone threat as like a Jared cook was, or as a, you know, Gates was Hunter Henry was, um, I see him as more of like between the twenties where he's going to have his most uh, production. So I'm going to go under, but that's not a bad thing. Like there's only so many, they can, there's only so much that Justin Herbert can do to spread it around. I mean, you got Keenan Allen, who's Keenan Allen, Mike Williams and Mike Williams. Josh Palmer is supposed to be much improved. You got Jalen Guyton for a lot of the deep passes. Austin Eckler takes up a bunch of snaps, but as a receiving back, like I just don't know how much is going to be there along with the fact that you still have a Donald Parham. So, I just don't know if the opportunities are going to be there for him to have as much volume as we'd like. Makes that's sense. not a bad thing for the team, but that's I'm going under. Okay. All uh, right. Let's go with. Ooh, you're going to like this. Okay. 47 and a half is going to be the number. And we're going to go with 47 and a half total sacks as a defense. Now, before you give me your over under, last season, we saw. Ten and a half from Bosa, five from Nuosu, four and a half from Tillery, and then like three or less from literally everyone else for a total of just thirty-five total sacks last year, which was twenty-first in the NFL. So, in context, over forty-seven and a half. If you were to take the over now and base it on last year's numbers, over forty-seven and a half would have been a top-five defense with regards to sacks last year. So. With the addition of guys like Mack and Van Noy, and which you might talk about, over or under 47 and a half sacks as defense? 47 and a half is the line, and last year's sack total was what? 35. 35. So 12 and a half difference. I would think that given the not only additions, but essentially upgrades that you brought in to have Khalil Mack across from Joey Bosa, having Kyle Van Oy essentially as your edge three. Chris Rumpf in his second year, you can, I know that Morgan Fox is going to look, be looked at more as a, you know, inside defensive line, but you could still be versatile enough to use him on the edge. So don't forget about that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, let's see, 12 and a half difference here. 
Hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't forget about Derwin James being close yeah. to the last scrimmage. And we're just talking total defense here. Total we're not talking defense. about specifically a yep. position group. Then, yeah, I, I will say I'll, I'll say that's going over because if you're able to unleash Derwin James the way you unleashed him, no pun intended, in 2018, with the additions that you've made just on the defensive lines alone, yeah, you can make up that 12 and a half. Okay, fair. All right, last one I got for you. Yeah. Defensively. Over or under 115 yards per game allowed on the ground rushing. <laughs> well, what did the Chargers give up last year? It was about it felt like it was about 139 a, a maybe... yards per game, which was 30th in the NFL. Man, was last year behind only the Steelers and the Texans. The Steelers was actually kind of a surprise. Uh, <laughs> the rush defense last year, Jake. Gave up the most first downs by a rushing play in the entire NFL. Did you know that? Eight and a half first downs allowed per game by rushing. And oh, by the way, tied for fourth worst yards per attempt rushing at over 4.6 yards per attempt. Any more pathetic accolades that you'd like to? I can keep going on top of that. I can keep going. Like, okay, but honestly, we've discussed a lot of the issues we saw last year with the interior deficit line. We've talked about like the lack of depth. Lack of competition last year, lack of toughness, lack of size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 115 yards per game allowed on the rushing on the rushing side would be like top 15-ish if you were to do that last year. So do you see this team going from like the worst in the NFL or worst, whatever, 30th at 139 all the way up to the top half at 115 or less? I mean, the easy answer here is you can't see it getting any worse. You just can't, especially with. Right, the I'm not saying that, I'm not saying over right. under 139. I'm, I'm giving know, them I, a 25. I got years. that. I'm just saying there's only one direction it can go, and that's up. So you might as well just start thinking. You know, <laughs> around that 115 mark would be really, really nice per game. Um, you know, I'm I'm gonna say over, but it's not going to be by much. I'm, I'm, I, it's not going to be by much. I still just don't think that you can drastically improve that much in a single year. And it may just take some time for the new guys to gel. Not again, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're going to be, you know, like it's going to be like the Titanic, like last year that you're going to be letting all these guys loose. I think that they will be serviceably better than they were considerably better than they were last year. Sebastian Joseph Day, Austin Johnson, if you keep Brendan Mahoko, who was one of your best run-stopping defensive linemen from last year, yes, it should get better. There's no question. But, you know, I'll say, I mean, yeah, we're talking about a difference of 15 yards per game. It doesn't sound like it's, or excuse me, 25, Jesus. Uh, It doesn't sound like it's that big of a number. You know what? Screw it. No, Dan, you know what? I retract. (laughs) Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Under under 115. Under 115. Yeah. Under 115. I was going to say, like... Right when I said that last sentence in my head, it finally, like, clicked. And I'm like, oh, idiot. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Let's... I'm literally just calling bullshit on myself. as, As tough as it will be to get 25 yards per game better, like, I think that's more of a of a example of how bad it was last year. Like... That was really bad last year. Like, we knew it. They knew it. The opposing teams knew it. And it just happened over and over and over again. The opposing teams knew it. The Chargers knew it. But they couldn't do anything to stop it even when they knew it. Yes. I.e., look at Week 18. Thank you very much. Oh, God. Look look at the Houston game of last year for crying out loud. uh, Okay. Anyways. uh, 115, I do think, is possible. And I don't necessarily think it's that crazy considering just how much of a overhaul. Like normally you'd say you every year you can't really go that drastic in improvement. But like this was a very out of the box way to like completely overhaul the defense. Like and just and just to you you said that 115 was like the average of like right in the mid middle of the pack. Well, I want to say like 10, I say like 10 to 15. 10 to 15. Okay. This year, 20, like, 25 yards is literally the difference between 10 and 15 and being 30th in the league yes. in run defense. But that's like a third. That's like a wow. I'm bad at math. That's like a 25% difference. Like it's a lot. That's a lot. And so most teams 
can't do that much of an overhaul in terms of like statistically getting that much better in one year. But most teams don't add a Khalil Mack, a JC yes. Jackson, an yes. Austin Johnson. Yes. It's the Bats Joseph Day. Yes. All in one season. And then you, with a Derwin James already there, with a Khalil Mack already there, alongside Kyle Van Noy, like there's a ton of dudes that were brought in, all of which better than what we had last year. And some of which much better than we had last year. And like specifically at that weakness. So I'm going to go with you, Jake. I'm pretty bullish. I'm going to go under. And I think a part of that is going to be one, because of the talent we have. But two, because I think this team is going to play ahead, which will not which yep. will allow, allow their point. defense to not have to yep. stop the run as much. Yeah, that's a great point, Dan. So, are there any other over under prop bets you want to give me before we head, head out of here? I know this is a bit of a long one, but we want to make sure we got some of these out there. Any Considering lines? that I was just pulling mine out of thin air, no, I'm empty. I'm good. Okay. Well, <laughs> then that will do it for Jake Hefter. My name is Dan Wolfenstein. You can find me at Chargers Homer. <laughs> no, um, we have a ton of stuff coming up. Uh, Chargers mini camp, or two, sorry, training camp starts about a month. So we have Rookies some- Report, I believe it's July 19th. So we have a few topics we're going to be discussing. We have some special guests that are going to be coming. We have some events that we'll be holding. So stay tuned for those. Um, if you had not had a chance yet, I do want to quick, give a quick shout out. Jen Mills, Chargers fan of the year, recently came out with a new podcast. It's Mills on the Mic. Mills on the Mic. Uh, congratulations to Jen, uh, member of the Die Hard Bolt Club, which we are partners with, and they are fantastic in all kinds of events. If you have not had a chance, please go subscribe. Go like her stuff on uh, on YouTube. Um, she has a really interesting kind of story that she's looking to give Jake. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to her first episode yet, but her inaugural yet. episode, um, it's kind of all about kind of setting the stage of what she's going to talk about. So it talks about like looking at the team from a fan's perspective, looking at the team from like a camaraderie perspective, look what's like at tailgates at SoFi, uh, looking at some of the businesses that are within the Bolt fam community, looking at some of the, the people that make up Bolt fam. So uh, a different perspective, less about like team stats analysis, more about like the fan perspective through and through. Nobody has their finger on the pulse of the fan base better than Jen Mills. Yeah. So again, Mills on the mic, go follow and subscribe on YouTube. Give a like, show them a comment, show her some love. Uh, congratulations again, <laughs> Jen Mills. Uh, otherwise, Jake, you can find him and his backwards hat. His five o'clock shadow is more like eight o'clock shadow at this point at Jake T. Hefner. One of these I days see. you're going to have to stop talking about like what I'm <laughs> wearing on my head or how much facial hair I have. His and baseball team. His baseball I tea. challenge you to say something different. Like it's like almost like when the newscaster's teleprompter goes out. Okay, Dan, what are you going to do? <laughs> You can find Jake and his Stranger Things t-shirts at Jake T. Hefner. That's a little bit better. You can find myself at Chargers Homer with my bags under my eyes with lack of sleep uh, you uh, on Twitter. Day. I have an excuse as well. Again, Chargers fans, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And we'll talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed.